now you had, he, he hyped me up so much that um, I'm kind of afraid of my talk. Um, so this is, this is really new stuff that I'm going to talk about today. Um, so the talk is categorical, speech perception is not that categorical. Um, and I have to emphasize first that I'm really, really grateful for being here. I, it's very kind of you to invite me here, so that's really nice. And I also should mention um, these people who are in the background. So Kenny Mandler, my advisor, is a constant support for everything that I do. Um, and Michael Spivey, who's very much in the conceptual background with a lot of the stuff that I'm going to be talking about today. But first and foremost, I have to mention um, Leonardo Lancia, who's my collaborator on the stuff that I'm going to talk about today. So he's really like the math genius and the computational modeling genius who get behind the stuff that you're going to see here. And um, we both did this, these, this stuff together. Okay, I want to start with an analogy. So if you look at this picture by the Chinese artist Wang Fu, you would say, you would, you would label this as a picture, you would label this as a painting. You would be correct in labeling this a painting, because it is, it is a painting. But just calling it a painting misses some of the interesting stuff that's going on behind the scene, because this is a very special painting. It's actually been painted with mouth and with the feet. So this is a painting that came about in a very different way than other paintings. But your categorization of this, your labeling of this, just doesn't reflect this. And if you'd known that this painting was painted in this way, you'd probably see different things in the final painting. So you, your knowledge of what's going on behind the scenes actually changes your perception of what's going on. And so I will argue in this talk that this analogy also holds for categorical perception. I'm going to give you a very quick, I assume most of you are familiar with categorical perception, but I'm just going to get very quickly the facts together. So, um, we, you, you, you have an acoustic continuum between two words, so for example, uh, in this case, in, in these studies, which were not French speakers, you'll work with a continuum between set and step. So set is a uh, French word for little mushroom, and step is just that English word for step. So you have a continuum where you can increase the closure duration, um, and you progressively add more um, silence just after the primitive. And um, you can make, present this to, to participants. And what you find is, if you ask people to respond whether this is a step or a step, naively, you would probably think you might expect something like this. So you might think that with more closure duration, when you go from one category to the other, you would expect a linear increase in, in uh, the people's responses. But of course, we know that this is not what's happening, so it looks much more like this. We have a um, range where people only respond with one response, and then suddenly, even though there's no actual acoustic discontinuity, there's a perceptual discontinuity, or there's a discontinuity of the response. Now, this thing then you would call the categorical boundary. Um, and so this is from identification experiments. Another thing that's important about categorical perception is that within each category, people are very bad at distinguishing different stimuli. But once you move, you have to keep the acoustic distance between two stimuli the same, and you move them across the boundary, all of, the, all of a sudden people are very good at distinguishing those two sounds. <clears throat> so it seems like people throw the perceptual information that's happening within these categories, it seems like they throw that away. So basically, they give the response, second step, and they're not sensitive to what's going on within those categories. So this is then how one of those identification functions, uh, uh, discrimination functions would look like, where basically within each category, people are very bad at this kind of Now this is old stuff, all this, so this is stuff that's become uh, basically people at Haskins lab in the 50s and 60s and 70s did research on this. And um, there's a whole, it basically jump-started a whole industry of categorical perception research. Um, one of the cool things is that apparently it's happened, it's, it happens very early in autogeny, um, and kids are very sensitive to these adult uh, categories. Um, and it seems to be, this, this invited the, the idea that maybe this is this um, special mechanism that is only, only humans have it. Um, but then, later on, people found uh, categorical perception effects actually good um, speech stimuli um, with chinchillas and butyrigus, and then across the animal world, you also see categorical perception of conspecific uh, calls in uh, frogs and in crickets, and also in close relatives like the macaque. So basically, it seems like there's also studies in mice and all kinds of animals. They all seem to have categorical perception at some level, 
And from an adaptive perspective, that seems to make a lot of sense because there's a lot of continuity in the world. And categorical perception allows you to basically unify your perception of this continuity. And a unified, allows a unified response to a particular type of stimulus. Now, categorical perception is so important that actually in this uh, 1987 volume it has been called the grand work of cognition. I think that's a very good, that's what most people see, seem to think of categorical perception. The idea is basically that categorical speech perception makes these categories available which are then used further on in processing. So the idea is basically that um, a lot of phonemic perception and all of that rests on categorical perception being true. Now, I will argue that this picture that we look at, and when people always, they always say it's, it's categorical, that this is a little bit like looking at this and just calling it a painting. Because what's going on behind the scenes seems to indicate much more continuity than people think. So in this talk, um, I'm gonna review some of the old evidence for underlying continuity, some of which you might already know. Um, then I'm going to focus on some work by Betty Tuller and colleagues on uh, order presentation, so where you have a sequence of stimuli and present them in an ordered fashion. And this will lead to um, a computation model that we developed with this behavior, um, together with experiments that test this, this model. And this model assumes underlying continuity. So basically, the only way this model works is because of continuity. Then at the end, I will look back at this model and we'll look at the model from a geometric perspective. So we'll look at the model from the perspective of dynamical systems. Okay, so what's the old evidence on the language here? So I told you that this is not what you find in terms of people responding in this two force choice task. However, it is what you find if you ask people to make goodness ratings. So if you have um, a if, if, if the task is different, then you actually get a much more linear pattern. And what's interesting about this in particular is that the distribution around this line is roughly normally distributed. So it's not the case that this line is the average of a bimodal distribution. So there's not people, some people responding here and some people responding there, but it's actually that people seem to kind of jitter around this line. And this seems to suggest that it's the same range, so somehow they must retain this, this gradual within category information. To me, the most exciting, um, or the most uh, interesting evidence for underlying continuity comes from time. So, if you actually do a categorical perception experiment, sorry, um, and you look at reaction times, you find something that looks like this. You find an increase of reaction times around the region of ambiguity. So it seems to me that people are slower when they're responding to a stimulus that's very close to the categorical boundary. And you actually, so this graph doesn't really reflect this as much, but you actually even find like this downward going slow within the category. So there are also timing differences within the category. And so this data can only be explained by assuming that at some level, both of them are represented, represented simultaneously. They're, the idea is basically that in this region, competition between those two categories is the strongest, and therefore it takes most time. So this is um, this has been found by lots of different researchers with lots of different tasks. So they've done this with um, uh, discrimination tasks, um, and they also with ratings. Um, but you can go even one step further and take a measure that's a little bit more continuous. So you can do eye tracking. So this is some really cool work by Bob McMurray and Spivey. Um, they've actually done um, dozens of studies on categorical perception using eye tracking, but this is kind of like the, the coolest first study that they did on this. And if you ask people to look at a black screen and they see either a bar or a pa on the screen, and you play them for the sounds from the acoustic continuum, so you play them these, these different sounds, it turns out that um, with, with eye tracking, you can actually um, look at the temporal evolution of this categorical perception curve. So here is, if you look at the eye movements below 300 milliseconds, you find basically no categorical perception curve. So the idea here is that when you put 300 milliseconds, that's not very surprising because eye movements take about 300 milliseconds to initiate. So um, this is not very surprising, but what you then see is along, if you, if you bin the data in these different timings, so 300 to 600 milliseconds, kind of looks a little bit more categorical. 
629 in the milliseconds. It looks even more competitive. So initially, people look at both bar and bar, and then they start to look only at one of the two categories. You can go on, and it becomes gradually the categorical perception curve that we all know about. Um, now, look at the timing of this. This, like, crisp and clear um, categorical perception curve is only the result of a process that takes about a second. And a second is millennia in cognitive terms. So, if you think about it, um, we say about five to six syllables per, per second, and so that's minimum 12 or more per minute per second. So if that's, if that's the rate of stuff that's coming in, and the process of categorical perception takes a second, then you don't really have time to come up with this really crisp um, presentation, and because you basically, there's new stuff coming in, so you don't really have the time to compute this whole thing. So um, the idea is basically that a lot of the time um, people are in the in-between, so they actually do represent both of those at the same time. Um, and only in these, that experimental context, when you, you're given ample time, can you actually um, develop this really categorical perception. And so, um, basically, most of the time when you're doing this kind of processing, you have these good enough type of representations, and that's work that's also, as people in other, I think, in syntactic processing, they also found good enough representations where people don't seem to have these these clear and crisp categories. So the way we think about this is we can think of each one of these two categories as a neural cluster or population for the things. So the process that activates them takes time. So it looks a little bit like this. You have a little bit of activation coming in, and then there's a little bit, both of them are activated because the the, the uh, stimulus might come from a region of the acoustic continuum where it's basically like a little bit in the middle. But then, closely, slowly, they, the population code zones in onto this one pattern. You can see that even at the end, there's a little bit of activation of the other category. So there's basically the idea that there's this competition process between these two population codes, and that competition naturally takes time. Okay. Now, so that's some of the evidence for online continuity from some older studies. There's actually more um, stuff, but this is kind of like what I wanted to focus on because it's going to help us with um, our experiments. Now, some of the most interesting work on categorical perception, I think, comes from uh, work by Betty Tour and colleagues and Scott Kelso and all of uh, that group of these dynamic systems people. Um, and they did categorical perception experiments in a very different way. So usually, people present the stimuli at random. So you would have a stimulus, if you, were the, if you were the participant, you would have a stimulus with four milliseconds, and then you get one with 36 milliseconds, or 12 milliseconds, so it's completely um, jumbled. And the idea of this task design is to get rid of all of that. And now, Betty Tuller and colleagues basically said, what if we dispense with that experimental constraint? And what if we actually design an experiment that's, that's designed to show auto effects. The idea is they wanted to show the temporal evolution across the scale. So they basically did an experiment that looks like this. You see zero, so you see an unequivocal set, and then one with four milliseconds and so on. You go along the sequence. And then once you're done, you go back. So this is a very different kind of uh, way of presenting this. Now, what would you find? What can, what can you possibly find in this context? So one thing is, you might find that the categorical perception curve doesn't change. Um, and they label this categorical boundary. So the idea is that if you're going from step to step, and if you're going backwards, it's always at the same spot. The categorical perception boundary doesn't shift. However, it could also be that people switch earlier in this sequence than you would expect based on either random presentation um, or where, where, you, where you predicted the, um, the categorical boundary to be. So this is kind of people saying, oh, this sounds, they, they basically, they highlight the, the, the differences of consecutive sounds. And so they are like, oh, this sounds a little bit different, so I'm going to already respond differently. So you could call this contrastive behavior, where people are overly contrastive. And that's how um, Tulin calls label this. You could also find the opposite. So you could find that people stay 
if one of the two categories fall one at a time, and then switch later. Um, so they basically highlight similarities between these sectors sounds. And that they call conservative behavior, or the, the um, uh, uh, term from dynamical systems, but this is hysteresis, the idea that a, a lot of systems, uh, including humans, tend to get stuck in the same response. And so this is reproducing the same response. And so they interpret this as um, kind of like this, this uh, hysteresis, this, this uh, result. Okay. We can take these two things, these two possible patterns that we could find in this experiment, and we can combine them into a contrast hysteresis index. So we could basically just look at what is the, what is the ratio of uh, contrasted versus conservative behavior. Um, and that's easy to compute. So here, these are our French words again. So we have a second step, and you see here people respond set, and then they switch along about half of the sequence, and then they respond step over here. And you have to think of this going back the sequence. And you see they respond step first, and then switch at exactly the same point. And if you take that point, um, so you, you, this would be point 10, for example, um, and you subtract that from this point, you get zero because they are like exactly the same spot. So that's one way of identifying this uh, categorical boundary pattern. If you have hysteresis, people stay longer within one category. And so you have a large number being subtracted by a small number, so you have a positive value. So a positive CH index allows you to detect hysteresis or conservative behavior. And you have um, the opposite enhanced contrast, early point and late point, so that's going to be a negative number. So negative numbers allow you to detect contrasted behavior. Now the interesting thing that you can draw out and call it an observative experiment is that the CH index changes in systematic fashion throughout a really long experiment. It looks a little bit like this. CH index starts relatively high, and if you remember that means people are more likely to stick to the same response. So they're basically a little bit lazy or conservative. And then as the experiment proceeds, they become more and more contrasted. So they highlight the differences between the second sounds. So um, people go from the region of hysteresis to the region of more contrasted behavior. Um, and in visual terms, it looks a little bit like this. People do this categorical perception curve at the beginning of the experiment, and then it shifts towards the front um, as the experiment proceeds. And they found this in multiple experiments. So this is like a consistent um, shift of people. <clears throat> and so what they did in order to model this is they basically modeled this as a dynamical system, which is basically you just come up with a differential equation or an equation that describes the change. And you have some parameters that basically um, you plug those parameters in, and then you are uh, able to, to show this this change of the curve throughout the experiment. And that's nice, um, but it's just basically like a mathematical model. So you basically have this one equation that you plus up in. What we wanted to do is this behavior, to see where we can actually grow it or um, let it emerge from something that's not like this macro perspective where we fit something to an equation, but rather we build a computational model that tries to create this behavior from the bottom up. So this is where um, our model comes in. And this is, again, uh, I have to emphasize joint work with Leonardo Lancia. So I'm going to walk you through this model because I think it's very useful to kind of understanding how all of these different parts go together. And then once we understood the model, we can reflect on the cool stuff that it does. So here we, we, we represent the incoming stimuli as an input layer. So you have uh, lots of nodes down here at the bottom. And one stimulus, so this would be set, so on the, on the far end of that side of the continuum, would be this node becoming really activated. And we actually do this with a bell-shaped activation pattern. So um, when you hear an unequivocal set, it doesn't only activate this particular node, it also activates the consecutive nodes. You can think of this as kind of like um, a neural system, so you can think of these different nodes as um, individual neurons, neurons. And then in this task, we basically just move this uh, thing along the input layer. So that's the first part. Then we have another layer, which is the category layer. So you have two categories, set and step. Um, the fact that we have just two nodes doesn't mean that we believe in, um, like, that it's just one neuron. It's actually, you can think of this as a cluster of neurons or whatever. Um, but we basically have these two categories. And then 
everything is fully connected. So every node in the upper layer is fully connected with every other pattern. So you have the fully connected neural network. Um, and if you don't know how these neural networks work, so basically um, you have an activation value, so that's just a number. Uh, so let's say this node is 0 0.8 activated, so it's, it's like this, this neuron is like firing. Um, and then this activation value gets sent through this connection, and you just multiply it by the strength of the connection. So these different connections can have varying strengths, and you just multiply it by that. So then this neuron receives the, the result of the uh, aggregated incoming connections. Um, so we model, so the, 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 the idea is that at the beginning of the experiment, these connection weights are distributed like this. Nodes to us on the, on the left side of the continuum are more supportive for one of the uh, category. So this would be the uh, set node. And nodes on the right side of the continuum are more supportive for the other category. And so this is kind of like already building in hierarchical perception. But this is, the idea is basically here that if you, when you come to this experiment, you already have to uh, you have two linguistic categories. You know, when, you, when you're a French native speaker, you come to this experiment, you already have um, a representation of step, you already have a representation of step. What's going to be interesting in this model is how this thing changes. Okay. More on the, the architecture here. So another thing that we have is we have these recurrent connection to, connections to itself. So each one of those categories is connected to itself, and it sends actually positive activation Onto itself, and that's actually so. This is this is report like we know that neurons sometimes do this. Um, but so the idea is basically <coughs> if you become activated, that's it. Um, if you become activated, then you tend to become a little bit more activated. So you basically have this kind of like feedback loop that um, is is um, going to signal signal out a particular value quicker. And on top of that, you have inhibitory connections between those two neurons. So you basically have. Um, if this one is activated, it sends inhibitory information to the other node. Um, and if this one is activated, it sends inhibitory information to the other node. And this kind of, this introduces a winner takes all dynamics. So basically, very quickly within the system, um, one of the two nodes will win. So that's why we built this the way. So remember, these are positive connections going from bottom up. These are positive auto-excitatory or recurrent connections. And these are negative. Now, I'm going to, to show you an equation. So this is the, the equation that describes the, the behavior of the model. So it's the model dynamics. Um, this is very complicated. Um, but so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a simplified version of this. And it actually makes sense for us to look at this in a little bit more detail because I think it's really cool to see how these different things come together. So this equation describes um, the change in activation of one of the two numbers. So the other y is basically from one time to one, from one time step in the simulation to the next, how much do you increase or decrease your activation? So if this is a positive value, you increase from one time, uh, time step to the next. If this is a negative value, you decrease. And then this is composed of a positive contribution to this, this change in activation and a negative contribution. If we unpack this, this is the incoming activation coming from the bottom up. This is the, the input layer. Um, and then we have this thing in here, which is actually really crucial and will become, um, will become really important in this talk. This is a habituation variable. And this implements this observation that neurons tend to become tired. So for example, if you, if you look at a um, green sheet of paper for a very long time, and you stare at it really closely, and you put the green sheet of paper away, you're going to see a white wall will appear more yellow to you. Because the green neurons are basically worn out by looking at, at green stuff for a very long time, and so your perception shifts in the opposite direction. <clears throat> so this implements this because we also observe this in speech experiments. And the idea here is that if you're really activated, if you're for a very long time, then you start becoming uh, less activated. So there's this kind of um, we are out effect. And then we have this is the, the incoming activation from itself. This is competition from the other node, which is a negative contribution to the, the whole thing. And this additional thing, which is passive leakage. So um, basically, one of the two categories, um, if, it's, if there's no incoming input, 
it starts going back to its base value, rate of firing. So basically, um, you, you're, if you're really excited, um, then you become progressively more normal again. Okay, so here's some stuff that the model already does with just the stuff that I showed you. This is time. I mean, imagine this as being an experiment, and you have different stimuli. So you present a set, let's say. Um, you present that multiple times to the model. So you hear set, set, set. It's the same stimulus. What you see, this is the activation of the two nodes plotted onto that graph. This one is the uh, activation of the set node, and this one is the activation of the step node. And you see at first that during the stimulus presentation, you have this rapid competition process. You see that one of the two is, at the beginning, they're like both pretty close, but then one of them is rapidly taking off, and one of them is winning the competition. So you're basically, at the end, unequivocally either perceive step or step. We also see that because of the passive leakage, if the stimulus the stimuli are presented quickly enough in succession, then you basically get this crowding effect where the, the passive leakage, your amount of activation when the next stimulus comes in is non-zero. So you basically um, start up a little higher, and that way you get even higher. And if you are presented the same stimulus over and over again, um, you basically become more and more activated. So this is already kind of core cool, um, simple behavior that the model produces. Now we have in one one crucial aspect is that we have an arbitrary set um, learning threshold. Um, so we want to make this model learn throughout a very long experiment to basically show this shift in the categorical perception curve. So there needs to some change needs to happen on a long-term basis. So what the learning does is the learning basically changes the connection rate. If you if this node becomes activated and it wins the competition process, the connections that lead to it that were contributing to that winning become strengthened. And so basically, as, as a result of this process, the ambiguous region of the continuum is slowly reduced. So basically, people become more and more categorical because this, this region in the middle where the, the connection weights are about equally distributed, it becomes smaller and smaller. And the stuff on the right side becomes more contributed to one of the categories, and the stuff on the other side becomes more contributed to the other category. So this is learning. Now, Let's take a step back and look at some of the cool stuff that this model does. So one is, it integrates different classes of facts. So you have perceptual competition, which is happening really quickly. You have habituation, which is this, that you, if you observe one thing very, a lot of the time, then you, you start going in the other direction. And you have a learning. And the cool thing about this is that these three processes that we know to exist, based on, on experiments, um, they happen at different time scales. So competition is a really fast process. Habituation is a much slower process. And then finally, learning is even slower than that. So we, we basically integrate these things that in this experiment, stuff happens at the small time scales and at the large time scales. So basically, um, integrates these different behaviors that happen at multiple time scales. And we think this is one way in which um, this model is kind of conciliant, it's, it's incorporating different facts. Because we know that perceptual competition exists based on experiment, we know that this one exists based on experiment, and we just put them together and see what happens. One other thing that we're doing with this, this modeling approach is we're trying to do um, so-called pattern-oriented modeling. As some people in ecology have written some cool papers on this. But, so basically what they found and what the idea is, um, routine uh, behind pattern-oriented modeling is, we want to have um, we want to model as many behaviors as possible with the same model. Because any good model that's, that just models one particular behavior, you, are, you can easily overfit. You can basically easily create a model that, that models just one particular behavior. But if you try to model many different behaviors at the same time, it becomes more likely that um, whatever you're modeling is actually reflecting the underlying process. If it's able to account for lots of different things at the same time in the same model. So what are the, some of the things that we want to follow? So one is we want to show this lowering of the CH index. Another thing is, um, and I haven't mentioned this yet, but we also want to show an overall speed of, of reaction times in this experiment. It happens in almost most, most of these speech perception experiments, people tend to become faster at the end of the experiment. So they basically, the reaction times decrease. 
And that's, that's something that is consistently observed in many speech experiments, and it's particularly in categorical speech perception experiments. We want to model that on top of this. So here you see the actual model result of the lowering of the CH index. You see the CH index, um, this is, this is, so here, this is position of the sequence. So basically this is the tenth time we went from step to step and back. So you basically, this is a really long experiment. You are participants, you are annoyed. Um, <laughs> it's, it's horrible. Um, it takes about an hour. Um, but, so the model, of course, is a pair. You just let the pair run. Um, and it already produces this interesting shift of the categorical perception curve from more conservative behavior initially to more categorical behavior. Okay. So where does this come from? Um, this comes from the, the increased um, competition dynamics. Because if you reduce the ambiguous region on the field, you're basically going to be more likely to switch earlier. Because if you if you have if you are if, if, if the competition dynamics aren't as strong, you're basically more likely to to just stick in the same response. Um, another thing that's that's cool is we out of these strengthened competition dynamics, of this reduction of the ambiguous region. Directly, immediately, you have these reduced reaction times. So basically, the model becomes quicker because it's easier for the model at the end of the experiment when the connection weights are up, when the learning has already happened. It's easier for the model to come up with a solution, so it's quicker to respond step by step, just like humans. Another thing that we want to show is this stuff that I talked to you about at the beginning about the timing of. of um, of the reaction times around the boundary. So if you remember, around the ambiguous, in the ambiguous region, people take longer to respond. This is something that we also observe in this model. So if you're hearing um, a step, step that's very ambiguous, that's close to your, your point where, where basically you would switch, um, you'll respond much slower, and that rapidly decreases as you get away from the boundary. Another interesting thing, so this is all stuff, behavior that has been observed so far, but here's an, an additional prediction this model makes. If you're going from step to step, <laughs> and then you're going back from step to step, the second switch, where you're switching, you're going to be much faster after that. Um, or, I mean, this is not much, but you're going to, you're going to be faster, you're going to respond faster. So here's why. So this is, this is plotting across the whole, this is going from step to step, and then from step to step, you see the activation of one node, and you see the activation of the other node, and here the other node becomes activated again, because this, these are the regions of the continuum that are most supported for those different uh, categories. But these happen quicker, so if, if this, is, this is exactly this curve, so people are quicker to respond in this region. And there's a simple explanation for this out of the model, which, is, which has to do with this habituation metric, because here, you are basically, you have two, two times you have the same stimulus in a row. That's kind of like the nature of the task. If you're going from step to step, and then back from step to step, you have a very long stretch in which you have the step category. And in this step category, you're going to have lots of activation going on, and that is able to trigger the habituation mechanism. And then the node for step is habituated. You switch, and um, that habituated node is a weakened detector. So basically, because it's, it is increasingly activated, it becomes um, a weak uh, competitor in this model. Um, so this, is, this gives you this uh, decrease in the reaction time. Okay, but note, what I've, I, I didn't show you here, that where, this, where the switch point lies. So the cool thing that the model does is this, the, the reaction time follows the categorical boundary. So wherever you are, um, that's where you're going to be slower. So it's not in the region of the ambiguity of the signal, but it's where you are most ambiguous as the system. And so if you are more contrastive at the end of the experiment, you're going to be slower in the initial phase. Okay. Now, some experiments. So we wanted to um, test some of the aspects of this model um, with some real human data. So one uh, very quick and easy experiment that we did, and I'm not going to talk about it much, is that we did this experiment with phoneticians versus untrained listeners, and it was a relatively short experiment, and we had 12 French name speakers. And they hear this um, ambiguous, so the step, step thing is ambiguous between step and step. The only thing that can manipulate is the closer direction. Um, 
And what we expected is that because politicians are really trained listeners, and they are basically they, they have already had a lot of learning in, in these tasks, and in particular these particular uh, politicians, they knew this task, so they, they have been in their successful experiment. We expected them to be more contrasted, because that's what the model predicts. If you're if you are if you have these strength and competition dynamics, um, and if you have lots of learning, you're going to have an earlier boundary because you're highlighting the differences of the set of sounds. We expected untrained listeners to be less contrasted. Um, and so, if you look here at um, this is the CH index, you see these are the um, these are the no these are the untrained listeners. These are the politicians. Um, and you see here, you have a relatively high value. So if you remember, um, this means that the switch occurred about four steps later than would be expected based on if you were exactly in the middle. And for politicians, it only occurred about one step later. Um, and that's a huge difference. It's of course significant and, and, and whatever, but that's a huge difference. It's um, basically showing these politicians switch earlier and higher differences. So that's just like, um, we wanted to show this in a between subjects. Uh, now the other thing is this experiment, where we had untrained listeners in a very long experiment. Um, and this is really horrible. Like, if you're participants, we actually had two participants drop out um, because we tell them in advance. We tell them, okay, this is going to be difficult. Um, and if you feel difficulty, if you feel that you're like not able to sustain attention, just stop. So we had two people stop. Uh, everybody else was really uh, bored and continues, but yeah, um, poor people. Um, <laughs> and this is a very long experiment. Here now, we basically, so what we do is we, we just replicate this Bessie Fuller experiment with French stimuli, but on top of that, we also look at the reaction times. So we take the full behavior of, um, of, of that our model predicts into account. And we found, um, so just summarizing this here, we found uh, a lowering of the CH index just to ask these Bessie Fuller experiments. We found these slower boundary reaction times that move with the pedagogical perception boundary. And then, crucially, we also found faster reaction times in the second half after the, after the switch. So that's just as I told you before, the competitor mode is, is a weak competitor because of habituation, and people do too. And then we also found this overall um, reaction time speed up. Okay, some other things that happened. Um, one of the things that you, if you look at this, this is our category perception curve again, people sometimes switch earlier. So people have a little jitter. I mean, people are noisy, noisy systems. We have lots of stuff going on in our head. And if we're in this experiment, um, sometimes we don't pay as much attention or we, we tend to think weird things. But so if, if you have a switch and then you switch later and this, you keep in that response, we count this as a, we call it flip flop. So they are flip-flopping back and forth between the categories. <coughs> and they could flip-flop anywhere in the sequence. So sometimes they would flip-flop back here, and then they're like, oh no, I'm actually, uh, I actually want to respond um, a step. And so they basically um, have this noise in their behavior. What we found is that the flip-flops are higher in proportion around the categorical boundary. And that's, again, something that falls out of these strength and competition dynamics. Um, because if you are in the region of ambiguity, noise is much more likely to swap you over and to the other category. If you are in this region where it's not really clear, uh, where it's really clear that, that you are uh, responding set, it's, it's an unambiguous set, you're going to be um, much less likely to flip up. Now, our model so far is, is completely deterministic. So everything we had is completely deterministic. So the question is, can we um, actually account for this? And yes, you can. If you just take this equation and put randomly this good noise at the end of it. And you find that around the region of the, uh, of the categorical boundary, you have a higher increase, um, or a higher proportion of these flip flops. So I'm going to actually show you some pictures of this And this. In the dynamic literature, it's called critical fluctuations. So the idea is that if you are the system, once it gets into the critical region where the decision is being made, you start to have more jitter. Noise has a larger effect on, on your behavior. So you actually observe this even in, in, in human movements. So if people move um, and they, they, they grab um, a can or something, um, just while they're making a decision, they start to have more jitter. And so when they 
in the region where they're not making a decision, they, they, they don't jitter or flip flop as much. Okay. Now here's one thing that really intrigued us, and this is unexpected. So, so far everything was the model produced these behaviors, and we showed them in the experiment. This is something which was the other way around. We found something that we didn't expect for coherence, and then try to, to see what we can account for with the model. So in, in this design, what we did, we counterbalanced the order. So half of the people heard step first, and then went to step and back. And half of the people went from step to step and back. Now it turned out that this created a huge change in behavior, just the very initial sequence. Um, and what happened is that if you hear a step, you're more likely to respond with a step. So your categorical perception curve is shifted towards steps, so you respond more on steps. And if you hear a step first, you're more likely to respond the opposite. And this is something that initially we were not sure exactly what to make of, but it turns out that it neatly falls out of this model, because it's again in, in this design. So, Remember that, first of all, we have these bell-shaped activation patterns. So remember that when you, so basically when you're here, you have a little bit of activation going on the other direction too. So even if you're still in the set domain, the other node can, uh, can benefit a little bit from, the, from the, this bell-shaped activation pattern. So that's one aspect. But then the other aspect is that you have these two sequences, this long sequence here in a row. So you get this repetitive, um, priming basically, they have the same or well, very similar stimulus, so repeatedly activating this one node. But initially, the connection strengths are not strong enough to really habituate that node really strongly. So initially, when the, the system hasn't learned as much, um, this learning actually, this little dip over here, is enough to basically then continue throughout the whole experiment, throughout our hour long experiment. The idea here is basically that this little, this little tips you a little bit in the direction of giving you a little bit of favor of, of, of step. <clears throat> and that is going to, because of learning, increase throughout the experiment. Or it's, it's at least going to, going to be, uh, remain stable. So this is actually something that's, again, kind of like a trademark of, um, or signature of dynamical systems. Um, it's called sensitivity to initial conditions, or extreme sensitivity to initial conditions. So you have this in like, a famous butterfly effect um, with uh, butterfly potentially being able to cause something much uh, much stronger, um, a storm. And here you have this just this change in sequence which changes behavior throughout the whole experiment. Okay, so now I've talked a lot about dynamical systems, and now I want to look at these, this stuff from this perspective, and you'll, you'll see and it will become clear what I mean by this in this context. <clears throat> so. Um, there's a lot of recent work where basically connectionist science and uh, neural networks have recently been meshed together with the dynamical systems framework. So these are, the, at, in the beginning, they were kind of like almost independent research uh, frameworks, but now people realize actually that they are the same. And I'm going to show this to you with this model. So in particular, I highly recommend Martin Spivey's book, uh, The Continuity of, uh, of Mind, where basically he's doing this, he's modeling something with neural networks and then looks at it from the perspective of dynamical systems. So one thing is that we, we find these signature of, of dynamic system. We find these signature behavior of systems that tend to change and that are susceptible to change and have history. So one is hysteresis. That's a classic um, finding in this field. So we find this conservative behavior. We also find these critical fluctuations of people um, flip-flopping around the boundary. And then we find this extreme sensitivity to initial uh, conditions. And we also find, um, so actually this, this um, slowing of the response around the, the ambiguous region is called critical slowing down. So that's another uh, signature generic behavior. Now, this view allows you to map the activation of those two categories into a geometry. So this is the acti activation of one node step. This is the activation of the other node step. And you can plot the activation of this on the x-axis the activation of the other one on the y-axis. And you get this beautiful picture, which is a state space of what's happening in, in between those two neurons. <clears throat> so here you have activation values of 
uh, set in this case, and here you have activation values of the step node. So basically, if you are, say here, 0 0.2, then you have 0 0.2 activation of the set node, but zero activation of the step node. So that's how you read this graph. And so this basically defines a landscape. Um, and these arrows describe the pull of the system in, in the direction in which it goes. So if you start with um, really high activation of set here, one, um, and even if the other node is really activated here, it's gonna pull you into this um, attractor. That's, that's a, the, how it's called in, the, in this literature. So the idea is basically perceiving a stimulus is like rolling a model through this landscape. So you can think of this as going down into this pit. And so in this pit, is, once you're in the pit, that's when you, you are basically perceiving either one of those two, those two categories. But the whole process that leads you there is part of the, the conceptual process. Because the whole process is basically just those two neurons becoming activated. And it's just mapped onto the geometric space. What you can then do is you can, this is actually also stuff from the model, so you can plot this evolution of this attractor landscape um, for multiple stimuli. So this is the first stimuli, where there's only one category possible, because in the first stimuli, you know, very in, in the far corner of the continuum. And then here, there's only the other category possible. And everything else in the middle has two possible attractors. And depending on which side of this line you start with, this is the separatrix, depending on which line you start with, you're going to be pulled into either category A or category B. And now we can, we can give you a visual description of what happens when noise is happening in the system. So here we add noise, and you see that if you have noise and you are in the, in the stable on the, the far end of the continuum, it's not going to pull you over onto the other side of the attractor landscape. But if you're in the, in the region where it's really ambiguous, where there's, there's, more to, like there's a, a, almost the same activation for both of those categories, noise can have a much larger effect because you're close to the line and you pull you over onto the other side. And then you actually erroneously, you're going to do a little block, basically. Now, some people, like Michael Spivey um, and uh, Rick Dale, they take this literally and project this onto a computer uh, screen. And uh, there's this, this, new, this new task that people uh, use, which is called mouse tracking. And um, it's been around since um, maybe seven years now. Um, and the idea is that you can look at this tractor landscape by looking at people's mouse movements while they're hearing stuff. It's, very, it's a very simple idea, but the idea is that if you're really processing, if, if that's what, what you're doing, your continuous movement is going to reflect that processing. And basically, you're, if, if one of the attractors is stronger, you're going to be more likely to fall into that. So you can think of, um, in this case, bar and pa, or here, can, um, it's a candle. Uh, candle and candy. So if you're hearing candle and candy, your your hand movements are a little bit in the direction of, of the phonological competitor. Um, if it's no phonological competitor, the, um, you, you're going to have less of a divergence or a, a, a pull into that direction. So the idea is that this this kind of literally turns outward this um, the state space. Now, one thing that surprisingly hasn't been done that um, uh, I want to do next basically is to do a mouse tracking experiment with um, this with protection. Um, so people have done it with these phonological competitors, but they haven't really done it with the continuum. And then what you would expect is that if you have bar here and par here, um, you would basically um, a more ambiguous stimulus would have would be more in the middle, and a more clear stimulus would be more into either one of those two sides. You can see that while people are thinking about it, because people are doing the movement while they're hearing. That's kind of like a push factor with this design. Now I wanted to mention this at the end because this is actually a way in which um, we can model this easily with this with this model because it's a continuous activation of two neurons anyway. We just have to map them onto this trajectory. Um, the task that we have is a very discrete one. It's just like the categorical uh, perception uh, task, where at some point, once you cross a certain threshold, you basically decide, okay, um, I'm going to be, uh, I'm going to give this particular response. So we impose this discrete response on this task just to be able to model this this behavior of participants. But if you have a more continuous task, you can actually show the underlying continuity. Okay. I want to wrap up um, 
And I'm going to point out some cool things. So one is that this model is very fertile. Um, so one thing, it's, it's scalable. So um, this, this set of equations that we used by Grossberg, um, Grossberg has shown in this work that we can send this equation to multiple categories, for example. So you can easily model a categorical conception task with um, uh, an alveolar, a bilabial, and a So you can easily have something uh, with three categories or more categories. And that's shown that basically these, these equations will generalize. Um, but it's something that we could do. Um, one other thing that straightforwardly falls out of this design, because we have this habituation variable, we can't explain these selective adaptation terms. So we can explain that if you hear bar lots of times, you're going to be more likely to respond to how, because your bar neuron is tired. Um, we can also, with this, because of the learning component, we could model perceptual learning. And finally, because it has this underlying continuity, we can also model mouse track. So, um, this is some of the stuff that we, I mean, some of this is rather trivial, uh, trivial so this really, in fact, is very easy to show with the model, but we want to basically extend this model to show these different experimental tasks, because then we, could, we gain more confidence in that this is somehow reflecting what's maybe going on. Um, now, so some other desirable features of this model is that it's fertile, so that's, it has these multiple applications. Um, it's pattern-oriented, so within uh, the experimental task that we model, we can model the full extent of human behavior that we observe. So it's very unlikely that we are, that we are overfitting um, our model to this behavior. And then it's consilient because it takes these different things together. So the question now is, is this what actually happens? I mean, we never know what these experimentation models. Um, one thing that this is showing is that, uh, so one thing I want to point out is that these ones are independently motivated. So both on experimental data, on behavioral experiments, we know that competition between two, for example, phonological competitors happens. We also know that neural competition happens, so we know that neurons send inventory information to each other. We know that habituation happens, and we also have neural explanations for that. We know that learning happens, and we have lots of neural work on, on changes of information. Rates. So each one of these aspects is independently motivated. And so we just put them together. So that's why we would say it's at least very likely that this is kind of like a, an initial reflection of, of some of the stuff that might be going on. But even if you don't want to take this into complete neural terms, if you, if, you, if you don't want to buy that this is actually what happens, what this is showing at the minimum is it's a proof of concept that with competition, habituation, and learning together in one system, you can model this interesting behavior. So it's at least showing that in this macro perspective, these three things make this behavior emerge. Now, I want to wrap up by pointing to the converging evidence for continuity. Um, we have seen these goodness ratings, where people don't throw within claim information away. We've seen the timing data, um, where stuff is slower around the boundary, and there are timing differences within categories. We've seen the eye tracking data, and lots of other work by Dominic Murray and Spivey that follow this. There's even more converging evidence, some of the stuff that we haven't talked about. So there's priming work um, suggesting within category greatness in these categorical perception experiments. There are indi interesting individual differences studies and response biases which show that people, some people are just not as categorical. And so that's another strand of evidence that supports that um, categorical perception is not that categorical. Then finally, we have these order effects which require, by their very nature, dynamic modeling. So either in the Venezuela type of models, these equations, or in the more bottom-up type of uh, connectionist kind. Um, and so what I want to suggest is that a lot of the time when we see this curve, we see categorical perception. A lot of the time, um, what's going on behind the scenes within this domain, and basic, basically um, the, 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 the nice details of this process reveal that it's much more continuous than the outcome suggests. So the idea is that basically the task forces you to look at it from a categorical perception, uh, from a categorical perspective. So action discretizes a process that's in alignment that's very continuous. And that's just like calling this a painting. Um, which is, it is a painting, so categorical perception is, the outcome is categorical, I'm not neglecting that. But just like there's lots of the stuff happening behind the scenes here, there's also lots 
lots of interesting things happening behind the scenes in the world of perception. So, thank you very much. <laughs>